Good morning. Good morning, Rabotai. Breakfast. And the class today is sponsored by Yossi Levi as a Seudat Hoda'a. And of course, the cold brew is dedicated, loving memory of Sammy Sayed, Leilu Nishmat Shalom Ben Rivka, sponsored by his son Isaac Sayed. My friends, there's a, um, a, a recurring theme that appears in the parashiot that we deal with over here um, that I think are a very important. Uh, uh, element to be able to pay attention to and to learn tremendous lesson from. We read about how Moshe Rabbeinu came to Paro and he told him, let my people go. Paro says no, and if you don't do it, Moshe warns him, right? Each time Moshe warns him, you know, the Makkah comes, and then after the first Makkah comes the second Makkah and the third Makkah. However, although it just seems like there's ten random Makkot, we learn on the night of the Seder that actually those makot were arranged in a very specific pattern. Each makah was uh, split in a set of three. So, uh, Rabbi Yehuda, Ayan noten bahem simanim. Rabbi Yehuda used to give a sign to be able to illustrate this point. Rabbi Yehuda would give a sign, a, a symbol, a way of remembering the makot. Ditzach, Adash, Be'achav. What does that stand for? The tzach is dam tzifadeh akinim. Adash is rov de veshechin. Right? Be'achav is barat arve choshech bechorot. Now, what's interesting to me is that at first glance, you look at it, you say, you know, hazaku baruch. You just took all the first letters and you added them. Okay, now, like, what, what, are we wiser? Because you gave us the, you know, and we needed Rabbi Yehuda to communicate that to us. What's the point? So the rabbis communicate a, a powerful idea. They say that what Rabbi Yehuda was pointing out, what he was drawing our attention to, is that it wasn't just ten straight makot, but that the makot came as a three-part series, and in each series, there were three levels to that series. So let's just go through the idea. In Emunah, in faith and in trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there are different parts. The first part is whether or not a person believes that there is a God, okay? So there are many people that believed either in idols back then, they believed in the powers of the stars, they believed in, you know, all and sundry, but they didn't believe in God, okay? And if, uh, uh, for those people, the first set of Makot came to illustrate that there is a God. But then there were people that believed that while there was a God, you know, that God uh, was not a powerful God, he couldn't interact, you know, with this world. It wasn't... He lived somewhere out there in the cosmos. He couldn't care less about what was happening here. He created the world, but then abandoned it to its fate. The slings of outrageous fortune of, uh, of Shakespeare, perhaps. Okay, That is the second level of a person that denies Bore Olam. And the third step, Rabbi Otay, is that while uh, uh, you might believe that God exists, and that while you might believe that God is interacting with our world, but does the person believe that God is the absolute power, that He can do whatever He wishes in this world, and there's nothing that can stop Him? Now, if you look at those words, Ki ani Hashem, I am God, number one. Bekerev aretz, in the midst of the land, number two. And the last thing is, En kamoni, there's none like me. There's none like me in, in all the earth. Now, these three elements, Rabotai, um, were part and parcel of the uh, of the illustration of the makot to the Jewish people, to the Jewish people and to the Egyptians. Now what I found about this fascinating is that effectively what the breakup of the makot is teaching us is that there are many individuated levels of faith that a person can have. And it made me wonder, what is it is exactly that um, is a preclusion which stops a person from understanding or having a muna on one level. Like, why, why if I believe that God exists, would I not believe that He exists here? Why if I believe that God exists and that God is here, why would I not believe or want to believe that there's no power like Bore Olam? And I want to share with you something that I think is, a, is a, for me it was just an eye-opening thought. You know, we like to divide our lives into neat little parcels, okay? What are the happy things of our life? What are the sad things in our life? What are the great regrets that we had? What are the great 
uh, achievements or accomplishments that, that we have. But Rabutai, that is nothing but selective memory. If you're most proud of your children, you are choosing to remember all the moments that they made you proud, and none of the moments when they drove you absolutely mishugah. You're not thinking about the time when they came back from school, you know, with a report that made your heart sink. But I'm not even talking about grades. I'm talking about chutzpah, you know, with the way they treated a teacher. Or when you find out about the fact that your child was bullying another kid, and you hear the meanest things that came out of their mouth, it breaks your heart, it makes you feel like you failed as a parent. You're choosing in the process of looking back at your life to focus on one part of your life's experiences and not on the other. But in truth, life is much messier than that. It doesn't fit into these neat little lines. Our marriages bring us tremendous happiness and tremendous heartache in select moments. Our children bring us intense pride, but also sometimes they make us want to tear our hair out. You know, our businesses, our jobs. So there's lots and lots of, uh, of these things in, in, in our lives. Now, emunah is, no, is not any different. Having a God that takes care of everything, that is in charge of everything in your life, is at the one hand the most satisfying, comforting feeling in the world, but also the most infuriating feeling on some level. Now that's a terrible thing to say as a rabbi, you might think, but I'm just trying to be honest with you. You know, when you know that Beracha comes to you when you have to do the very difficult things in your life, when you know that, and you know that this challenge that's sitting in front of you is what's standing between you and Beracha, and you know that there's no way to sketch him, you can't pull a move around God. You know, there's no one you could speak to to say that God is treating you unfairly. You can't sue Hashem in court you know, to give you what you want, because it's a wrongful termination of your job. This just doesn't work. So on the one hand, you know, it's, uh, I understand the men like Paro. I understand him. The most powerful man in the world. Now you're going to come to him and tell him that he needs to give up some of that power. It's a very tough thing that, to give up that power. So number one, Mi Hashem Sheshmabakolo, who is God? that I should listen to his voice. Paro, in the beginning of the story of Misraim, represents the most arrogant uh, form of, of human being. He's not only rejecting the fine interactions of God in our world, but he's claiming, Mi Hashem asher ishma He's not asking a simple, or saying a simple thing. He's saying that I, I myself, I am God. Now that doesn't sound like a sane thing to say. But in actual fact, the terminology of God is something that is worshipped, something that is given deference, right? What is God? If I ask you to define this terminology, what, not who is God, but what is it? You'd explain that it was a source of power that a person treats with respect, that they are grateful to, right? Even in the 12 steps of, uh, uh, of an alcohol, of an addict, of addiction. There's one step which says that you submit to a higher power. You accept that there's a higher power. It doesn't say if that higher power is Hashem, Yeshu, Allah, you know, uh, Buddha, Karma. It just says that there is a higher power. You're accepting that there's something that is more powerful than you. That's a difficult thing for the human, especially the male ego, to be able to accept Rabotai. So the first step in the human evolution is accepting that you cannot say, Mi Hashem Asher Ishma Bekolo. Who is God? I'm God. I decide. You know, I think that's a terrifying thing that a man learns. That moment in marriage, when a person learns, a man has to learn, that he can't fix all the problems. What a powerful thing that is for a man for the first time. We've been trained, wired to believe that we fix problems. When a problem comes, you take care of it, you solve it. But unfortunately, sometimes you learn, usually in marriage for the first time, that that's not how it works. And there's things that you can't solve. And there's feelings that, like, what do you want? How many husbands have said to their wives, 
what do you want from me? Like I'm trying, what do you want? That's the moment when you recognize me Hashem, Hashem, Eshma B'Kolo is not there. You know, you have a successful business and then all of a sudden you get hit. And for the first time in your life, you have to ask somebody to bail you out. You've tasted that and it can be in any area in your life. That's the moment when the person learns to cross out the Mi Hashem, Hashem, Eshma B'Kolo. Who is God? I don't know this God that you speak of. Who is God? Rabotai, the crazy thing to me is that it's not just paros that deny God, it's each and every person in this world that does it as well. And I'm including in that religious people. I'm including in that myself. Mi Hashem Hashem Bekolo is when you lose your mind over an election. Who's God? Trump's the man. We don't have him, we're dead. You all need to move. That's not Jewish. It's not a Jewish sentiment. We learned throughout history that we could never place our hopes. And yes, we saw a path that made the most sense for us. You want to be able to do something in, in, in the past. You know, we, we've seen things that we thought, you know, it made sense to vote for this person. It made sense to throw your support behind this candidate for a king, for a prime minister, whatever country we ever lived in. There were things that made sense for us to do. We galvanized as a community to do them. But that was never the be-all and end-all. Mi Hashem Hashem The fact that we believe you're hiding in your house from Corona, that's Mi Hashem Hashem But also, you're not taking any precautions, Mi Hashem Hashem In either case, you're ignoring God. You're cutting God out of the equation. In either, in either case, too extreme to the one or too extreme to the other, you're cutting God out of the circle of the uh, of the conversation. So the first question is that a person has to know that while I have every obligation to do my very very best, ultimately it will be God that makes the final decisions. That's the first lesson that Paro learns. The second lesson that Paro learns is that Borei Olam is very interested in every minute detail, and he involves and engages in the most minute detail of our lives. The Gemara says that if a person reaches in his pocket and he's trying to get the quarter and instead he pulls out a dime, now he has to reach in his pocket again, that's called Yisurim. That's called that a person suffered. And that's going to take, that's going to be a kapara for him. I need you to hear that one with it. You reach in your pocket, you put, you pull out, right? how often... Do you try every pocket before you find the one with it? You went through all of your pockets and you're thinking, what kind of Muppet am I? That I can't remember where I put my phone, I put my wallet, I put my thing. That was Hashem right there. To think that on that level, Borei Olam is present. Ani Hashem Right in the middle of the land. I love this idea, by the way. What does it mean, Bekerev Ha'aretz? What does Kerev mean? In the middle. Look at the word Aretz. What's the middle of the letter of the word Aretz? Resh. Right? Resh is a person's head. Ani Hashem bekerev Aretz. I'm in the midst of the earth. Borei Olam says, I'm everywhere. The only reason why you don't see me is because your head is not on me. You're not thinking, if I'm not in here, then I'm nowhere. And if I'm here, then I'm everywhere. The job of a person is to inculcate and to find Hashem with him everywhere. Because of that, the synagogues uh, across the community have developed a custom to place a sentence uh, an, in every single synagogue, usually on a sign. It says, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. That means I placed God opposite me always. In many of the synagogues, they had a custom to have the Lamnatzer with the, with, the, with the menorah, but at the top of the menorah, there was a the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu written in big letters. Also, to be mekayem, this idea of placing Hashem lenegdi, tamid, opposite me, always. Rabotai, this is a very important idea. Placing Hashem in front of you always. That's how a person, when they put Hashem is in the resh, then Hashem is bekerev ha'aretz, he's in the midst of the land, he's there always to be able to deal with it, to help you with your issues and with your problems. 
But finally, Rabotai, is this idea that we end with, that there is no greater power other than Him. The En Miyadi Matzil. After you believe that there is a God, and after you believe that He's here and He's present, and He involves Himself in the minutia of our lives, still the last thing to learn is that there's no power like Him. And, and I think that that's something as well that everybody needs to work on. I'm of course including myself as well. You know, we talked about selective memory. But I think there's also a second part of this selective thought process. When a person gives God power but not enough. They decide when they say Baruch Hashem, not Baruch Hashem. They decide when they're going to... Uh, when they're going to place their faith in Him and when they're not going to place their faith in Him. The relationship between you and God is not something that's on again, off again. He's not a one-night stand. Right? It's a constant. When a person understands that on a uh, level of interaction by God, then in Kamun Chola Aretz. There's no, there's nothing like, there's no power like God anywhere. And I, I want to just share what that looks like and what that will wrap, uh, will wrap up for today. You know, if you look at the different expressions that Rabbi Yehuda divided the makot in, you'll notice, obviously, that there's something that's off. <clears throat> What's off about the division of Rabbi Yehuda? Ditzach, Adash, it should be Be'ach, and that's it. There should have been nine. Each one of the makot had Moshe give a warning, then Moshe on the Yeor. First he visits, visits him in his palace, then he visits him at the Yeor, at the, at the, at the sea, at the, uh, the banks of the river, and then he visits him, and then he doesn't visit him at all. There's no warning, and the makat just comes. Illustrating that in every level of lesson that we learn in our lives, Borei Olam reaches out in significantly each time in a, first it's the most convenient, HaKadosh Baruch Hu pays a house call, you know. Then, you know, he hits you when you're not ready for it, you know, and, but he lets you know it's coming, and then without warning. And each time, Borei Olam, he gives you a chance to learn, but the, the messages get louder and a little bit more disruptive each time. But the problem is that in this sequence of each level of learning, the three steps, there's one unattached one, and that's Makat Bechorot. That tenth one seems to stand above and beyond all of the rest. Now, the question is why, number one, just for sake of symmetry. But the second question, Rabotai, I want to ask you is, we all call it Makat Bechorot. But for some reason in the abbreviation, what is it called? Bechorot. So the question is, do we refer to it as Makat Bechorot, or do we refer to it as Bechorot? And why outside of the system is it called Makat Bechorot, and inside the system it's called Bechorot? And I want to just share with you something that, like, this blew my, this blew my mind. Rabotai, you know, the word makat means the plague of bichorot. And there's many different interpretations as to why we would call it bichorot or not makat bichorot. One of the reasons, I'll give you an example, is the idea that's brought down in the Midrash. The Midrash says that makat bichorot was made up of more than one makat. First makat was the fact that, the, of course, that we knew that the bichor, the, each bichor would die at the stroke of midnight. But not only that, the, the Makkah itself incorporated a much wider swath of destruction, path of, or swath of destruction. Why? Because when the Bechorot learned that they were going to die at midnight, they all gathered in front of Gracie Mansion, right? They all, they had a protest with signs, Bechorot lives matter, and they started yelling and screaming and telling the Paro, you better let them go. Because if you don't let them go, we'll overthrow the government and let the Jews out. So each son strapped on his sword, and they went to war with Egypt on that night. That's why the Pasuk says, Ki en bayit asher en shamet. There wasn't a house that didn't have a dead person. The simplest question is, what was there? Not a house that didn't have a bechor? So the Midrash gives other answers to that as well. But the idea here is, in fact, that not only was the makah of bechorot, not only did it happen um, from, from, uh, from the God-given you know, stroke of midnight, uh, plague, but also Rabotai, that the, the Bechor, Egyptian Bechorot themselves were killing their own. And in fact, the Sepharim point out that that's what we mean when we say in the Tefillah Hodu, we say, 
Bibchorehem. It doesn't say Limake Bichore Mitzrayim. To he who hit the Egyptian firstborns. It says to he who hit Egypt, Bibchorehem, with their firstborn. The firstborn themselves became the source of, right? So Rabotai, I think those two ideas are being illustrated in Makat Bichorot and Bichorot. What was different about this about this plague, which earned it, so to speak, its own level, its own makkah, was that there was the regular God-given element of the plague, and then there was the outcome of the plague, which in some ways was much more devastating. You know, if a God from heaven is striking at you, okay, fine. But that your own children should strap on a sword and come at you, what's worse than that? What's worse than the your people turning against you, yourself, your families being torn apart, not by an external driver, but internally. So when Rabbi Yehuda is talking about it, he just talks about Bechorot. He's calling, talking about the plagues. He mentions each plague, the Tzach, Hadash, Be'achav. He lumps them together because he's talking about the Bechor part of the, uh, what's it called? Of the, of the Makkah. But there's a separate Makkah which is much greater. Rabotai, and that's what I wanted to illustrate to you today. There's two elements that we need to be worried about. One element is our own lives. And the way we act and the way we think, there's a price that we pay in the outcome of our own lives. But Rabbi Tai, if we are not educating our children, there is a natural progression that happens in the world around us. And this is the thing I think that is the most scary about education in our day and age. And that is that we like to think that we are the only ones that educate our children, but that's just simply not the case. The world also educates your children. And there are things that you would wish that they are not exposed to or understand or see or involved in, but just by definition of the fact that the world is going in a certain direction, your children are going to be picking that stuff up as well. And then your parenting and what worked for you when you were a kid is not going to be enough for them. Rabotai, if we needed levels of emunah when we were kids that needed to be drilled into us by the, all the things that our parents did for us and to us, our children that have so much more in, on their mind, so much more pulling them away, they don't need what we needed. They need what we need times 10, times 50. Think about this for a second. The influence of God back in our day was fighting the other influences. But how much time and how much shiviti leneged did, did yesterday's cultural influences have on your family? How much of that was opposite them always? You know, you turned on the TV, you listened to the news. But when you shut the news, your house was the environment. Your community was the environment. Today, we are so impregnable by everything from the outside that we need to dial it up 10 times more. Otherwise, this idea of makat bichorot, of there being a plague that's brought about not on the family, but from within the family, where the family itself tears itself apart, where the elders, so to speak, rebel against and lead the children against the parents, Rabotai, that is something that is a very real concern. So it is a time today of instituting, of driving home our messages in a way which is stronger than ever before. And if it used to be enough to come to shul on Shabbat, or it used to be enough to your grandchildren and your children to be Jewish, to come to shul on the holidays, now it needs to be 10 times more. They need to see the prayer, they need to see the study, they need to see the respect, they need to see your faith, it needs to be displayed. Today I tell people to give tzedakah from their homes to study Torah from their homes. And I wonder if one of the gifts of Corona has been that for the first time in many, many years, your children watched you watching Torah. Your children watched you praying at home. Your children watched you putting on tefillin. HaKadosh Baruch Hu needed to shiviti Hashem it a little bit more, to bring it in front of their eyes a little bit more. Use your head, be creative, think of ways of making God's presence all the time, making it permanent in front of yourself and in front of the eyes of your parents and your, cha your, your children. And when that happens, Rabbi Otay, then all of the messages, the three levels of emunah are present in your life 
but also we stop needing messages behind, uh, you know, where God knocks in an ever louder manner uh, at the doorways of our lives. Baruch Amen. Amen.